Two days ago, I posted a video critique of Sean McDowell titled, Sean McDowell's Radical Sectarian Attack on Progressive Christians. That video elicited a very strongly worded reply from uh, Tom Gilson in a blog article. In fact, it was uh, the article or the video apparently triggered him so much that he came out of retirement from blogging and restarted his blog just to respond to me. I'm going to offer a response to Tom in this video. I'm going to begin by just taking a quick look at the ending of his article. So here's the article. It's titled, How Not to Do Apologetics, Dark Example from the Tentative Apologist Randall Rouser. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? It gets worse from there. Uh, Mr. Gilson uh, goes down, has a bunch of, of critiques. I'm going to come here right to the end. He says this. You attribute some pretty ridiculous and reprehensible beliefs to Sean McDowell falsely. Your doing so is itself utterly reprehensible. It doesn't matter how much you may dislike him. If you care about honesty, you need to withdraw these false statements. You can disagree with him all you like. Just disagree honestly, okay? And if you're going to present yourself as an apologist, do try to work on the quality of your argument too, please. I try to train people in evidence and in logic. This doesn't help anyone, not one bit. So there's two things in here, uh, apart from the very over-the-top language. The one part is the allegation of deceitfulness. He says that um, I'm not being honest twice. He says I'm not being honest. And then the second thing is the condescension. So those two things are off-putting. But the other thing is I just didn't find very much of substance in the article itself. So I'm not going to really interact with his article. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit more broadly about these issues, uh, fleshing out the context of my critique of Sean McDowell. Those who've watched all of my videos and critiques of people like Sean McDowell and also Alyssa Childers and who have read my book, Progressive Christians Love Jesus Too, probably won't be much that's new here, but maybe it'll be helpful to hear it all brought together. The one thing that I have often found among conservatives like Sean McDowell and Alyssa Childers, well, they've just ignored my critiques. Others have responded. Mike Winger also has ignored my critiques. Some others have responded, but but for the most part, the responses that I've gotten, uh, very often they are people who are incredulous that I would offer these critiques. And yet I'm responding to positions that, as I will show again and explain here further, like with McDowell, these are people who are denying I'm even a Christian at all. And yet um, I'm not... It's it's not for me to be offended, apparently. It's for others to be offended at my critique by pointing out the implications of what they're saying. It's a certain amount of gaslighting that I experience in moments like that. And frankly, I get that sense of gaslighting reading Tom Gilson's article. So uh, let me say, first of all, a few words about this. So in, in the video, I critique McDowell as I say that he conflates historic Christianity, the broad tradition of historic Orthodox Christianity, with his narrow American Protestant evangelicalism. And Tom Gilson is seemingly outraged by this, uh, by the claim that I that, that um, McDowell has made this confusion. But he has, I believe he has. He certainly set himself up for that critique. You see, he gave a glowing endorsement to Alyssa Childers' book, Another Gospel, this is what uh, McDowell wrote in commending her book, Another Gospel, on the book itself. He says, Alyssa Childers compares and contrasts the historic Christian gospel with the progressive gospel, in scare quotes, meaning, of course, it's no gospel at all. Nothing is more important than accurately representing the good news of Christ and responding to challenges against it which is why I am grateful for her courage and clarity. So he really underscores a couple things here. He underscores, first of all, that what Alyssa Childers allegedly presents in her book is the historic Christian gospel, and um, that she has presented that accurately. And the alternative is the progressive gospel, which is no gospel at all, and is just a false gospel. 
So McDowell both affirms her presentation of what historic Christianity is and also uh, contrasts that with whatever progressive Christians say, which is another religion entirely. And the irony as well here is that he underscores how allegedly important it is to represent views correctly. But in fact, Alyssa Childers doesn't represent historic Orthodox Christianity correctly in her book. As I point out uh, in Progressive Christians Love Jesus Too, among her many errors, uh, in her book, she conflates the Christian doctrine of atonement that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself with the penal substitutionary theory of atonement, that Christ died as an atoning sacrifice in our place to satisfy the wrath of the Father. She further conflates the Christian doctrine of posthumous judgment, that there is a judgment in the afterlife for those who are outside Christ. She conflates that with the doctrine of eternal conscious torment, a theory of atonement. So in each case, she ends up then leaving the reader with the conclusion that the Christian gospel includes and is defined by, the historic Christian gospel is defined by penal substitutionary atonement and eternal conscious torment for those who die outside Christ. And the, this is just flatly in error. The historic mainstream Orthodox Christian tradition has never endorsed penal substitutionary theory of atonement as part of the gospel. That's an interpretation that is held by some Christians, particularly Calvinists and a large segment of Protestant evangelicals generally. But it's not a central teaching of Orthodox historic Christianity. Likewise, while eternal conscious torment is certainly the most common view throughout history of posthumous judgment, it's not in the creeds. It's, it's not part of what is definitionally historic Orthodox Christianity. Look at the Apostles' Creed, for example, simply a belief in life everlasting. Um, there have been Christians throughout history who have adopted alternative views, such as annihilationism and eternal conscious, tor uh, sorry, uh, universal restoration. Those are egregious errors on Elizabeth Childers' part, where she is ineptly and ham-fistedly conflating the conservative evangelicalism with which she was raised with the mainstream Orthodox Christian tradition. And McDowell endorses her book without any qualification, and not just on the book itself, and not just highlighting in his endorsement of the book the importance of accurately representing the views of others. No shortage of irony there. But also, he's collaborated with Alyssa Childers on multiple other occasions. And I've never once heard him raise any objection to her presentation as to what historic Orthodox Christianity is. So I must assume that McDowell, to be charitable, that he's consistent in his reasoning. So if he believes she accurately represents historic Orthodox Christianity when she conflates it with the particular doctrines of her Protestant North American evangelicalism, then I conclude that he is doing something similar until and unless he critiques her and distinguishes himself from her. But of course, that will raise the question, why did you endorse the book with that endorsement in the first place? And why have you said nothing about it in terms of criticism in the last three years? So again, I will continue to believe what I said, contrary to what Tom Gilson thinks. Now let's talk about progressive Christianity itself. McDowell claims, as does Alyssa Childers, that it is another religion entirely. It's just not. That's not true. It's false. They are spreading falsehoods. If, if Gilson is so concerned about people spreading falsehoods to the point of cons being concerned that they might be dishonest, he should really turn the concern a little closer to home, I would submit. Here's what progressive Christianity is. 20 years ago or so, evangelical leaders like Brian McLaren, Rob Bell, Tony Jones, and others were beginning to question the conservative evangelical tradition in which they'd been raised and in which they'd been ministering. There'd been some growing sense of tension, inadequacy with the tradition. This was anticipated in the late 90s by people like Dave Tomlinson, uh, a British evangelical who wrote a popular book at the time called The Post-Evangelical. It was also anticipated by evangelicals in the mid-90s who were beginning to have conversations with the post-liberal movement of the time. There was a book published around 1996 exploring these themes called The Nature of Confession. So these conversations had been going on for a while. And in the early, nine, the early 2000s with people like McLaren, Rob Bell, etc., they really coalesced around the idea of a new movement 
which was at the time called the emergent movement or emergent or emerging Christianity. By the early 2010s, that which had been called emergent and emerging Christianity was now commonly being called progressive Christianity. So as a result, for most self-described progressive Christians and most who others describe as progressive Christians, most of them have come out of a conservative evangelical tradition. Now I'm going to pause for a moment. There are also others who use the term progressive Christian who come out of a liberal tradition. John Shelby Spong is the most well-known example of these individuals who come out of a mainline Protestant liberal tradition. Um, and there's a website called progressivechristianity.org, I believe is, is the URL, which represents Spong's views, which are quite different from those that have come out of the evangelical tradition. So you have to keep that in mind, that progressive Christianity can be used to refer to people who are quite different in terms of their theology and ethic. So these former evangelicals that are now beginning to rethink the doctrines of evangelicalism, they're deconstructing certain doctrines that they had once held and reconstructing, building up something else in its place. And these are some of the things that they've been thinking about in the last 20 years. Moving from complementarianism in gender relations to egalitarianism, moving from young earth and old earth creationism to models of evolutionary creationism or theistic evolution, moving from particular views of inerrancy and uh, such, as, such as those that are represented by the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, to alternative accounts of biblical inspiration and authority, such as moving from a focus on propositions in the text to the idea of uh, a narrative theology. As I mentioned earlier, moving from penal substitutionary atonement as being the doctrine of atonement to exploring other alternative models and theories of atonement, such as nonviolent theories of atonement, Girardian theories, governmental theories, kaleidoscope theories, or no theory at all. I'm moving from understanding posthumous judgment in terms of eternal conscious torment to alternative models and theories, such as annihilationism or conditional mortality and universal restoration or universalism moving from alternative models of church-state relations, becoming critical of Christian nationalism, from the alignment of Christianity with a Republican political perspective or a commitment to the Second Amendment as being definitional to Christian fidelity, uh, considering end-of-life and beginning-of-life bioethical issues, so rethinking or wrestling with issues like uh, the legislation for physician-assisted suicide or for elective access to abortion a renewed sense of social justice, concern for marginalized groups, refugees, and minorities who have often been otherized by the broader evangelical tradition. And also considering, and this is, of course, probably the most controversial issue, reconsidering the voices of a coalition of sexual minorities that are commonly represented by that broad umbrella term LGBTQ+. But it's important to recognize that in this whole warp and woof of theological reflection, deconstruction, reconstruction, exploration, there's no unifying creed that unites everybody as one religion, just as there isn't in evangelicalism. Rather, what you have is a very broad and overlapping set of some shared interests and perspectives. This is not a new religion. It's Christians figuring out what they believe on various doctrines, sometimes getting it wrong, sometimes getting it seriously wrong, and other times getting it right and offering very valid and important critiques of the conservative evangelical traditions in which they were raised. Now, some self-described progressive Christians end up rejecting core Orthodox Christian doctrines, such as the Incarnation or the Resurrection, some I've heard have endorsed what I would call radically immoral libertine sexual ethics. But you can find these same kinds of problems within evangelicalism. Shall I remind us about the former president of Liberty University, Jerry Falwell Jr., who along with his wife had an open marriage and made sex tapes with a pool boy? Should I talk about televangelist Kenneth Copeland, one of the biggest evangelicals in North America, certainly in terms of his uh, financial statements, he raises millions every year, promising health and wealth to little old ladies living on a pension. 
Should I talk about the high-profile pastor and author, Douglas Wilson of Moscow, Idaho, who was infamous for writing a book defending the virtues of slavery? You know, we could go on all day giving particular examples of evangelical leaders who have deeply problematic theological views and ethical practices, just as you can with select progressive Christians. As the saying goes, people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Alyssa Childers includes among her list of progressive Christians people like Peter Enns, Brian Zond, and Rachel Held Evans. As I carefully documented in my book, Progressive Christians Love Jesus Too, each one of these persons is clearly and uncontroversially a Christian. They're not adherents to another religion. Yet, Alyssa Childers claims otherwise. Two months after Rachel Held Evans died, Alyssa Childers talked about her on her podcast, and I just posted a video a few days ago about this. And in that podcast, she expressed the hope that Rachel Held Evans may have repented and turned to Jesus before she died. The implication being that if she did not, she would be in hell for eternity. Think about that. That's pretty clear that Alyssa Childers believes Rachel Held Evans must have repented or she is in hell this very moment. I would submit to any one of you to read Rachel Held Evans' book, Searching for Sunday, alongside Alyssa Childers' book, Another Gospel, and consider which of those two people sounds more like a Christian who is deeply rooted in the rich soil of the Christian tradition. I've asked Sean McDowell to comment on this, and he has always rebuffed me. So I must assume, until I hear otherwise, that he shares Childers' views that Rachel Held Evans is in hell unless she repented before she died. And I must assume that he holds uh, Alyssa Childers' view that people like Peter Enns and Brian Zond and myself are going to hell unless we likewise repent. You see, I am also a progressive Christian. I would accept that term of myself. I think that would be broadly accurate in terms of the semantic range of the term. I would meet that definition. I talk about my own story in my book, What's So Confusing About Grace. I converted about the age of five years old. I was raised Pentecostal. I've been a Baptist since the year 1996. I received my doctorate in systematic theology from King's College University of London in 2003 with a leading from the re, leading Trinitarian theologian Colin Gunton. And I've taught for the last 20 years at an evangelical Baptist seminary. Yet according to Childers, and by implication, according to Sean McDowell, I'm not a Christian at all. At some point, I stopped being a Christian if I ever was one. And I'm currently now the adherent of an entirely different religion. The gospel I seek to teach to my students is not the Christian gospel at all, a fact that I'm sure the administrators of my seminary would be very interested to know, not to mention the pastor of my church, Greenfield Community Church. And if I do not repent, I will go to hell, the same hell that will claim an unrepentant Rachel Held Evans. In the midst of all of this, Tom Gilson is offended at my critique of Sean McDowell. Well, Tom Gilson says he's friends with Sean McDowell. Perhaps then he should ask his friend why he keeps spreading false claims about progressive Christians as a group, sowing discord and division and misunderstanding and propagating misinformation, leading people to think that Christians who are, as a group, just as imperfect and flawed as evangelical Christians, are nonetheless doing their best to try, try to deconstruct and reconstruct their own faith and think through what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century. And for all of you, I just have this word. We have to keep on this. It, it really grieves my heart that 
evangelical leaders, people like Sean McDowell, Alyssa Childers, Mike Winger, Frank Turek, Lee Strobel, many of them who seem to be very nice people one-on-one -on -one when they're talking in a friendly environment, have nonetheless chosen to build a significant part of their ministry on the promotion of false and harmful ideas about fellow Christians, claiming that we are deceivers, that we are deceptive, that we don't care about truth, that we have a false gospel, that we are members of another religion, and that we will go to hell if we do not repent. These are harmful ideas. Again, they are ideas that only serve to sow division and to drive a wedge between Christians. So continue to speak out. Don't do so in anger. Do so directly, uh, as I try to do, because I think that we owe one another the charity of being direct and honest with one another. And that's what I try to be in my videos. I try to point out uh, plainly in, in plain speech without undue appeals to emotion or other logical fallacies, but just show the full implications of what people are saying and then hold them to account for the implications of what they're saying. And hopefully through all of this, we can begin to have further dialogue and we can get to the point where evangelical Christians will stop spreading these kinds of false and harmful claims about their brothers and sisters in Christ.